Hey guys! So, real quick before this video starts, I do want to let you guys know that I have another video that's going to be out this weekend, though this guy will be on my Patreon. So, if you enjoy this one and want some more new content right now, there's early access to my next video that's coming out in a week or so on Patreon currently, right now. Link to that will be in the pinned comment. Dolls have been integral to Japan for the entirety of the country's history. They are used to both celebrate and mourn. However, despite all of this, Japanese dolls have also been integral to rituals and curses as well. There are an abundance of tales showcasing the horrors of cursed dolls, as well as many real-life locations associated with them. So today, we're going to take a look at the more infamous ones. Awashima Shrine is a famous location in Japan, located in Kada Bay within Wakayama Prefecture. The shrine itself is dedicated primarily to the god of medicine, particularly in regards to women's health and fertility. For this reason, it attracts many female patrons wanting to get pregnant or wishing for a safe and smooth birth. Despite this, these reasons are not the main draw to the temple. The primary reason many flock to the shrine is to bear witness to over 20,000 dolls enshrined here, giving the shrine the nickname of the Shrine of the Dolls. The majority of these dolls are Hina dolls brought to the shrine by the former owners, brought forward to be disposed of. Which brings us to the question of why? Why are these dolls left at this temple? Is there something wrong with them? Well, most of them do not carry malicious intent. These are the dolls you can visibly see along the shrine's exterior. The reason the dolls are brought here lies within Japanese culture and appropriate actions to take with dolls. So, allow me to provide you with a little context. According to Japanese folklore and superstition, dolls are objects highly likely to become possessed by a spirit or entity due to their human-like appearance. Some dolls are even made to intentionally resemble a deceased person in order to encourage their presence to return and visit family. So, if a doll is disposed of carelessly by being thrown in the trash or abandoned, it is believed that the doll's spirit will become nefarious and vengeful, seeking revenge and misfortune to those who mistreated and abandoned them. We'll explore some incidents like this a bit later. Luckily, there does exist a way to properly part ways with a doll. This is where Awashima Shrine comes in, as well as the rituals that take place here, known as Ningyo Kuyo. Most rituals entail a ritual cremation of the dolls, while others involve sending Hina dolls out to sea. While Awashima Shrine sits on the coast, the shrine performs cremations on the beach. This only applies to the malevolent, good-natured dolls, however. For what the visitors do not see is the shrine's basement. And located within the shrine's basement are dolls brought to the shrine with Iwakutsuki, or questionable or concerning origins. For that reason, the dolls are not publicly displayed or cremated with the untarnished dolls. This is for the safety of the public and to ensure the unadulterated dolls pass on properly. So, instead, these dolls remain behind locked doors, doors that remain off-limits to the public. Over the years, those who tend to the shrine have witnessed many bizarre occurrences taking place in the basement, such as paranormal activity and one specific doll that has hair that continuously grows. Not to be confused with another famous curse doll, this one is known as a miniature Okiku, and it was donated to the shrine over 30 years ago, when the family that owned this doll noticed its hair began growing on its own. Ever since that day, the doll has remained locked within the shrine's basement. Those who manage the shrine refuse to show the doll or take it out of the basement at all, claiming it houses a vile and dangerous energy. They also state that the doll prefers to remain undisturbed and untouched in the basement. For that reason, they maintain a safe distance even when in the basement.
This next tale involves a Japanese doll, but a more modernized one. The specific doll in question is what's known as a Rika-chan doll, a more westernized fashion doll that's still a popular toy today. Rika-chan was introduced to the Japanese toy market in 1967 by popular toy brand Takara Tomi, back when the company was referred to as Takara Vinyl. Around this time, Barbie dolls were already being distributed in Japan, though not as successfully as in the West. You see, Barbie and her more mature Western styles were often perceived as frightening to Japanese children. For this reason, Takara came forward with their own answer to Barbie with Rika-chan. Rika's soft eyes and modest dress appealed to the Japanese consumer, for the cute and innocent aesthetic has typically been preferred over a womanly, glamorous one. While preference certainly has varied over the years, this still remains prevalent. Rika herself is an 11-year-old elementary school student of Japanese and French descent. She has one older sister and five younger sisters, a set of twins and a set of triplets. She also has three dogs and a parakeet. Though, despite Nika's harmless appearance, there exists a dark story spread among those in Japan for decades now, one that greatly contrasts this doll's sweet image. This is the story of the cursed Nika-chan doll. Sometime during the Showa era, there was a mishap in one of the Takara factories, an error that resulted in a batch of new Rika dolls having three legs instead of two, this third leg being muscular and not matching in the slightest. When children received these dolls, not seeing the third leg initially under the packaging, many became upset and even scared. Parents hurried to exchange these dolls for ones that didn't have this jarring error, and this error was later recounted by many people online. These online users claiming that this was a very real mishap and that Takara swiftly issued a recall of the defective dolls. On online forums, some recalled receiving this doll as a child with an extra purple leg. Others claimed the leg had hair, while others recounted it having a texture very similar to human skin. And this is why the fabled Nika doll has been dubbed the cursed Nika-chan. Though, many also claim this, that there was one girl, one that didn't find the defect unpleasant, one who saw her Nika-chan as unique and wanted to keep her. This Nika ended up being the girl's favorite doll, playing with her all the time buying her new outfits that accommodate the extra leg and bringing her along on family trips. Though, as the years went on, the girl became a teenager and soon a grown adult, no longer playing with toys. Over this time, she kept the doll in storage, though eventually did come across the Rika doll within a box of her old things. Feeling she needed to get rid of some stuff she had sitting around in storage, she decided to go ahead and throw away the box her formerly beloved Rika-chan included. Some time had passed and the woman learned of a phone service that allowed girls to call a number and speak to Rika-chan. This phone service, really just a pre-recorded series of voice clips, made her feel a bit sentimental. Wanting to hear Rika's voice, she dialed the number. And, to her surprise, she heard no voice on the other end. After waiting a while, she hung up deciding it was just some kind of error. It was much later that night, around 2 or 3 in the morning actually, when the woman heard her phone ringing. Startled awake, she groggily made her way to the front room to answer it. Once she did, she was met with something quite… unexpected. Hi, it's Lika-chan. Gosh, it sure is cold over here. I'm surrounded by garbage and I hear this awful crushing noise. Why did you leave me here? I just want to come home. Thinking this was some kind of bizarre prank, the woman abruptly hung up the phone and returned to bed. The next morning, after waking, another call was received. The woman answered and heard this. It's Thika-chan again. I don't know why you hung up on me last night, but I wanted to let you know that I'll be coming home real soon. I'm on my way. This time, the woman was genuinely freaked out. She yelled at the caller to leave her alone before hanging up. And it wasn't long before the phone rang again. Why did you shout at me? You've never shouted at me. I'm on your street. 
It really won't be long before we're together again. Don't you miss me? Upon hanging up this time, no words spoken, the woman rushed outside and looked around. She saw nothing down the street and rushed back inside, making sure all doors and windows were locked. She closed all her blinds as well, unsure who was responsible for this sick joke. Soon, the phone rang yet again. The woman answered with trembling hands and shouted at the caller to stop harassing her, to just leave her alone, that this joke went on long enough. Open the door. And after hanging up this time, the phone rang again, immediately. The woman ignored it this time, terrified, but it never stopped ringing. After five minutes, maybe even ten, she answered the phone one last time. When Nika spoke this time, she said this. Hi, it's Nika again. I'm right behind you. Maninji is a long-standing temple with a lot of history, being established hundreds of years ago and sits in the mountains, far away from most civilization. Getting there in itself is quite the challenge, as there are no bus stops nearby, and without your own method of transport, you'd have to pay a great deal of money in cab fees. That is, if it's not snowing. Being in such a desolate mountainous part of Japan, the snow makes the roads impossible to traverse during harsh winters. In addition to all of that, the temple is not open to the public and visitors are not encouraged. Nowadays, a form is required just to grant access to the property. With all of that considered, it's clear to see that Maninji Temple does not want people physically traveling to its location, and that location is one far away from most towns and cities. Is there a reason for this? While the temple wasn't erected in such a desolate place intentionally, the location now serves as ideal. This is because one of Japan's most fear-inducing objects is held within this temple's very walls. For almost 100 years, the shrine has been home to a peculiar doll, one that is said to grow human hair at the rate of a three-year-old child, completely on its own without any reason as to why it does so. Some even say she grows human nails as well. Both hair and nails needing to be trimmed routinely by the temple priests. This is, according to stories and eyewitness accounts, a task that has been carried out for as long as this doll has resided at Maninji. This doll is Okiku, arguably Japan's most infamous doll. Out of all the horrific doll stories to grace Japan, none are as infamous and well-known as the tale of Okiku, a tragic yet somewhat terrifying tale that has been told many, many times in the past. So, in an attempt to not give you guys the same song and dance, allow me to present my own retelling of the tale of Okiku. The year is 1918. A 17-year-old boy named Ekichi Suzuki was visiting Sapporo to see a marine exhibition. During his trip, he visited Tanuki Koji, a famous shopping street within the city. It was here, displayed within a shop window, where he noticed a beautiful porcelain doll. This doll was about 40 centimeters tall, that being around 16 inches. Her eyes were a deep and beautiful black color, and her hair was styled in a neat bob cut, uniform and not reaching past her shoulders. Not a single hair out of place. The doll was dressed in a beautiful red kimono. Ekichi was immediately drawn to the doll and wasted no time in buying it. Following the exhibition, after returning home to his small hometown, he gifted the doll to his younger sister, a two-year-old little girl named Kiku. Kiku was immediately taken by this doll as well. It wasn't long before Kiku had decided to name the doll Kiku as well. Kiku loved her doll and she played with it every single day. Doing absolutely everything with this doll, it never left the little girl's sight, throughout the good times and the bad. 
With that said, it was only a year later, when Kiku was only three years old, that she fell ill. What initially seemed like just a cold only worsened as time went on. The little girl's doll remained at her side throughout everything. Up until Kiku's tragic passing from her illness in the year 1919. The family was stricken with grief to say the least, struggling with the reality of losing their beloved daughter at such a young age. Before Kiku could truly grow up and live her life, all the family could physically attribute to Kiku now was her beloved doll. Initially intended to be laid to rest with Kiku's body, some confusion during the funeral proceedings resulted in the doll not being laid to rest at the gravesite. So, instead, fully intending to treat the beloved doll with respect, the family placed Okiku within their home's altar, praying to the doll every single day in hopes that Kiku's spirit will pass on peacefully. While one could hope for this outcome and some kind of closure and resolution to the family's misfortune, things did not end there. After some time, the family noticed that the blunt short hair of the doll was somehow becoming longer, longer and more unruly, losing the original uniform straight shape. As time went on, the hair only grew longer. Just like a real child that had their hair growing and not styled or brushed in any way. The family, while surprised and confused by this, did not wish to get rid of the doll. This phenomenon was not something that scared them. While the hair growing from Okiku's head was jarring, the doll didn't cause any trouble and did not have any nefarious intent. However, they eventually concluded that Kiku's restless spirit, not wanting to pass on, may have possessed the doll. After all, it was her absolute favorite thing in this world. With this in mind, the family continued to pray to the doll every day, grateful for Kiku's presence still being with them in some way. It was much later on, almost 20 years following Kiku's passing, when the family was preparing to move outside of Japan. While they had continued praying to Okiku each and every day without fail, they didn't feel right about taking the doll with them. Feeling as though the doll retained its supernatural ability to grow hair due to being in close proximity to Kiku's grave. Perhaps part of them also felt that Kiku's doll should be in the care of a temple so that her soul could finally be at peace. With all of that in mind, in 1938, the family left Okiku in the care of a priest at Maninji Temple before departing. Though, they did warn those there about the growing hair so that there wouldn't be any surprises. After some time, the original priest was able to confirm this himself, and in the many years since, the temple has done well in keeping their promise and caring for Okiku just as her family had. Whether the girl's spirit or just a portion of her influence causes Okiku to grow hair, who is to say? The temple adorns Okiku's shrine with photos taken throughout the years, all of which show the doll with different hair lengths. According to the shrine, a sample of Okiku's hair was once tested by a lab as well, with the results indicating that the hair is the same in structure to a human female child. They also included that the rate of the hair growth was akin to a young girl about three years of age. It is completely unknown how much truth there is to this. However, the legend of Okiku remains prevalent throughout Japan to this very day. Much like many other island villages throughout Japan, most notably the famous Cat Islands, Shikoku was once thriving with a rich community. The story often remains the same for these small locales. Places that were once thriving and prosperous, later seeing their population slowly leave for the mainland or seek out more opportunities as the years went on, eventually leaving no one and becoming a ghost town. Nagoro is a village that sits in Ia Valley, a desolate location surrounded by mountains. The village itself was never exactly booming, having only around four or five hundred residents at its peak. This is far from today's numbers as the village had a population of just 35 in 2015 and 27 in 2019, with the number likely being even lower today. As people both left and passed away, it brought a lot of dismay and sadness to one of the town's residents, this resident being Tsukimi Ayano, a woman who was born in the area. While Ayano moved from Nagoro as a child, she had returned to care for her elderly father in the early 2000s. 
Noticing how abandoned the village had become over the years, she decided to memorialize the life it once held in a rather unique way. It was in her own father's likeness that she created her first doll. A doll not made from porcelain or in the resemblance of any smaller traditional ones one may picture in their mind. Rather, a life-size doll made to resemble a real person. This first doll was placed outside to appear working in a field, a sight that was once common in Nagoro. It wasn't long after this that Ayano felt this doll filled a void, and its presence was somewhat soothing. People using dolls to cope with grief and complex negative emotions is actually common and effective. Dolls have been given out to help nursing home patients in coping and encouraging a positive mental state. In addition, women who have suffered miscarriages and stillbirth or struggle to conceive in general will often purchase realistic baby dolls referred to as real dolls to nurture and love as if they were their own baby. Ayano's joy in seeing that first doll out there in the field urged her to continue, deciding to make a doll in the likeness of every former village member who had moved away or passed on. The one she remembered, that is. Decades passed and Ayano continued to make these dolls as more and more people left or passed on. Eventually, Ayano finished 350 of these life-size human dolls, most of which being based on real people both alive and deceased. These dolls decorate every facet of this abandoned village. Couples on park benches, families outside on the front porch of now empty homes, women outside farming and men fishing. Each scene really creating a time long past, a time the doll's creator greatly longs for. Looking up Nagoro Village on Google Images will yield many unsettling image results of the village and the dolls. To those unfamiliar with the village's backstory, these images are quite haunting. And as the years went on, Nagoro faced yet another devastating blow. The final two students and the final two young people in the entire village had graduated school. This meant no more students to teach, and the school had no choice but to permanently shut down. With this, the few left in Nagoro decided to come together and help somewhat, creating a student body of dolls to decorate the schoolhouse with. Two of these dolls made to resemble the two final graduates. Walking through this village, a completely barren village with no people, only dolls, is quite unsettling without understanding the context. And there may soon come a time when no villagers remain within Nagoro, when the only memory left behind will be these dolls. A lonely glimpse at the vibrance Nagoro once had. Something that may never be seen again. Sometimes described as the Chucky doll of Japan, the story of Noroko is one similar to Okiku, but far darker in nature. While Okiku is a doll treated with respect even to this day, and said to house the gentle spirit of a young girl who was loved while living, this is not the case for Noroko. Noroko was a woman who lived during feudal Japan. She was said to be unparalleled in her beauty, and truly beloved by the community. She was sought after by many for her beauty, though some seeked her out for different and unexpected reasons. For her beauty eventually caught the attention of a Buddhist sect. The sect invited her to stay the night at their temple, treating her with the utmost hospitality and an expensive meal to warm her up to them. That night, as she slept, one of the priests snuck into Noroko's room, using a cleansed sacrificial knife to strike her through the heart. Immediately following, the priests gathered to perform a long band fertility ritual, smearing her crimson blood across every last inch of the doll's surface. This is said to have attached Noroko's soul to this doll. And Noroko herself, having never been able to marry one of her many potential suitors or bear children of her own to carry on her beauty, became angry, vengeful, and aggressive. Her spirit, bound to this doll against her will, darkened with an energy too strong for those living to contain. 
The doll continued gathering dark energy as the years passed by. This doll, having been passed from owner to owner for hundreds of years, is said to have caused mishaps to everyone who has obtained it. Today, it's said to exist within a vault or storage facility of some kind, owned by a wealthy private collector. First-hand accounts describe this doll coming alive and becoming active in the dead of night, always at the same time each night. This time is when Noriko is speculated to have been wronged by that temple all those years ago. Some even say that the wealthy collector was ultimately the victim of the doll's wrath at this hour, and that's why the doll now sits in storage. Wadaningyo, meaning straw doll in Japanese, were commonplace in ancient Japan. These are dolls never meant to use for celebrating or playing with. Similar to the Western concept of a voodoo doll, Wada Ningyo are created for ritualistic purposes. This brings us back to Japanese beliefs regarding spirits and dolls. Dolls with humanoid likeness are believed to be capable of housing a lost or distressed human soul due to their likeness matching that of a real human body. For this reason, Wada Ningyo were created with the intention of intentionally attaching these spirits and capturing them the target typically being evil spirits. Wada Ningyo are often created then left outside, around the perimeter of homes and shrines and even along roads and trails. This is meant to encourage spirits to inhabit the doll and prevent them from causing harm to others. One recorded instance was lining a village road with Wada Ningyo to protect a village from spreading plague. As nefarious entities were thought to be at fault for rapidly spreading illnesses, these dolls were considered highly dangerous after their purpose was served. These possessed dolls were ultimately dumped into rivers to purify and remove the spirits, though this was not the outcome of all Wadaningyo. Some were used with malicious intent when performing rituals with the intention of cursing. This type of dark ritual requires human hair, and the doll itself has to be constructed in a way that differs from the other Wadaningyo. These rituals were quickly made illegal, as was the construction of these types of dolls. And who's to say how much damage these dolls have caused? <laughs> 